This is video 11 in our series, uh, Topics in Tensor Analysis. A reminder that the playlist for all the videos is uh, featured at the website at digital-university.org. Okay, in the uh, previous videos, we had discussed two kinds of operations where we have a general curvilinear system and here we just had three quadrant axes u1, u2, u3 and then we had a position vector being expressed in terms of Cartesian coordinates or if we wanted to we could also express that position vector in terms of the uh, curvilinear coordinates u1, u2, and u3 and when we take the partial of the position vector with respect to any one of the coordinate axes, that gives us a tangential vector. And that's what we're showing here in this diagram. So that if we take the partial of R with respect to U1, and each one of these coordinate axes really is a space curve, and we take the partial derivative of R with respect to U1, it gives us this tangential vector. And again, we've covered this in great detail in the uh, uh, previous videos. Now, all the axes are labeled with superscripts. And the vectors that are tangential to each one of these axes, they are labeled with subscripts, as we see here. Now, the other type of operation that we considered in videos 9 and 10 primarily was this where each one of the coordinate axes um, really is a scalar function it's a, it's a space curve essentially and we can take the gradient of it um, we, again we went over this in more detail in, about, in the uh, uh, previous videos when we do this this gives us a vector and what we saw happening was that these vectors that we make are orthogonal to the tangential vectors so that we can have a situation like this here we have a curvilinear coordinate system u1, u2, u3 and again um, it could have some position vector r we're not going to draw that in but what we're trying to show here is that with a coordinate axis u2, there's the tangential vector with the subscript. And for the coordinate axis u5, at this particular point here, here is a tangential vector e5. And the way we found those was taking these derivatives. Then, if we do this type of operation, that gives us the orthogonal ones where this E2 is orthogonal to the U5 axis at this point. So this would be orthogonal to the tangential vector E2. And these orthogonal ones we label with superscripts. And likewise here would be the vector orthogonal to the U5 axis at this point so it would be orthogonal to this tangential vector. Now what that means then is that if we have some vector A we saw that we could express it in terms of its components along a particular axis for example the U2 axis and the U5 axis and that's what we're showing here well, these components, the component along the U2 axis, we label with the superscript in each case. And we said that this, these are what the contravariant components of a vector are. And the vector is being expressed in terms of its components along the axis vectors or the vectors that are tangential to them. Now, the other way, when we express this vector by considering its components along these 
orthogonal vectors here. Just taking the orthogonal projection of this onto here, and then taking that, expressing that component like this. Take the orthogonal projection of this onto here, then expressing that orthogonal projection like this. Well, now here we use subscripts. Then this is a different way of expressing the same vector. And these are the covariant components of the vector. And then what we'd also shown in the previous videos is that Here's a vector A, and here are the tangential vectors E5 and E2. And again, A is expressed by summing up the components along these tangential vectors for E1, E2, E3, and so forth. What we found is that if we express this vector in a different set of curvilinear coordinate systems, there's a definite pattern that the way the components of the vector transform from this curvilinear system to this curvilinear system. And we derived the formula like this, and we had discussed in the previous videos that this is indicative then of contravariant transformation. This is how the contravariant components of a vector transform from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. And again, we worked those details out um, in the previous vectors, or in the pre previous videos. Now here, here would be vector A, again, in the U coordinate system. Only now, we have orthogonal vectors to E2 and E5. Here's U2. Here's U5. And here are the orthogonal vectors to each one of these coordinate axis labeled with superscripts. And again, our vector then we can express as summing up the components along these orthogonal vectors that we created by doing this kind of operation. And then what we found was that if we consider how this vector is expressed in a different curvilinear coordinate system, these contravariant components transform according to this pattern. So we had discussed that quite a bit in detail um, in the previous videos. Now, we also pointed out that this is not an orthogonal, this is not a unit vector. This is not a unit vector. Um, for some systems, like the spherical coordinate systems, each one of these are orthogonal to each other. The ER, the E theta, the E psi. These are all orthogonal. If we take the dot product of these with each other, you get zero. But for our general curvilinear system, most of the time, we're dealing with systems where these different coordinate axes or their tangential vectors are not orthogonal to each other. But again, when we consider the relationship between this kind of a vector and this kind of vector, then we found that they are orthogonal to each other. And we expressed that in this form. This, of course, being the Kronecker delta function, so that if i does not equal j, this is 0. They're orthogonal. If i does equal j, then it comes out to equal 1. So the dot product of these can be 1, even though these themselves are not unit vectors. And again, if i differs from j, then they're orthogonal to each other. And we call these reciprocal bases. So again, if we have a vector a, 
we can write it in terms of its covariant components, which we express like this. Or we could just abbreviate this expression in this way. Whenever we have a repeated index that appears in an uppercase and a lowercase, let's just put an equal sign in here. There, hopefully that makes more sense. Then this means that we're summing over this repeated index. So i equals 1, then i equals 2, i equals 3, and so forth. Now, these repeated indexes, um, we could have different letters in there. For example, we could have called this A, D, E, D. It would mean the same thing. D is going to be equal to 1, D is going to be equal to 2, D is going to be equal to 3, and so forth. So when we have these repeated indexes, it means we sum over them, and because you can have any letter you want in here, sometimes they call them dummy indexes. Now the vector A can also be expressed in terms of its covariant components. So we'd have A1. And this, we could abbreviate like this. Where again, the repeated index means we're summing over it. So i equals 1, i equals 2, except we didn't label this one correctly. This should be upstairs. And this one should be upstairs. i equals 2 i equals 3, and so forth. Now, let's say that here we have contravariant components of a vector. Um, say we have a, let's say aj, ej. What happens if we take the dot product of this, say with e i? Well, we know that this is the Kronecker delta j i. So this equals 0 unless j equals i, then it equals 1. So this would give us a i. Or for here in this case, well, so what we have then is this is vector, this is the vector A. So what we have established then is that, and that's pretty straightforward, is that vector A dot EI equals AI. So this, if we have a vector A, by dotting it with these vectors here, which we obtain with this kind of an operation, gives us the contravariant components of the vector. Now we can consider the same concept here where we work with these. Suppose we have A, J, E, J, and we take the dot product of this with E, I. And again, this is the Kronecker delta J, 
Okay. I and this equals zero if j does not equal i, it equals one if i is equal to j. So this then, j has to be equal to i. So we have this. If j does not equal i, then it's just zero. Same thing up here. If we get to explain that very well, is that here we can say j has to be equal to i, otherwise that's zero. So j is i. That's how we get a i over here. Same thing in this case. So here we can say that, well, this is the vector a. So vector a taking the dot product with any one of its tangential vectors gives a covariant component of that vector. Okay, so we just wanted to be clear about that. Now, and I think it was video number five, we had considered kind of generalizing then from contravariant vectors and covariant vectors into uh, tensors. And back in that video, the curvilinear systems we were working with was just x and y. And we were considering what happens when we transfer either a vector or a tensor from this coordinate system to this coordinate system. And again, this is, we went over this in more detail in, uh, Video 5, so I'm just going to look at it quickly here. Here is a contravariant vector. And then we showed how we can generalize from a contravariant vector to a contravariant tensor. And likewise, here is a covariant vector. And then we generalize from that to a covariant tensor. And then finally, in video five, we considered a tensor that has contravariant and covariant components and how that transforms from one system, from one coordinate system to another, from the x curvilinear coordinate system to the y curvilinear coordinate system. And again, we're not going to discuss that in detail here. We went over that in quite a bit of detail in video number five. Okay, so that wraps up this discussion then for covariant and contravariant components. Um, we spent 11 videos doing that, so we hope it was helpful. In the next video, we are going to tackle the subject of metric tensors. So come back and join us for that video, and we'll continue with our discussion.